met for the first time in 2005 and got to see his research take off in 2013-2014 uh, is Ibram Kendi. And so these folks have come together to change the way we talk about ourselves and the way that we imagine our past and what's possible. At the same time, their work wouldn't be possible without the kind of breakthrough scholarship that comes from people like Eddie Glaude or Keisha Blaine, mm -hmm. Penny Williams or Clement Price, um, Larry, Larry Evan or Larry Green, um, Wendell White, amazing scholar down at Stockton State, and uh, Donatrice Allison. These folks' names are not as well known, but they create the building blocks by doing the historical scholarship that lets us begin to figure out new questions that have to be answered as we go forward in the 21st century. And so, to that end, there are a couple applications that I, I want to really put in place using that work. And the first is in terms of education. A uh, lot of what I've seen, both in Monmouth County, but across New Jersey, is really troubling in terms of what's evolved since the late 1980s. That here in Asbury Park, they used to be called Abbott, Abbott districts, now they're called Title I schools. Mm -hmm. But places that receive lower funding, and then when there was some correction a couple years ago, it became politically controversial, to consider how do we actually fund our public schools in ways that actually provide for the most chances of quality success. I've been happy to work for the last few years with the Cherry Hill School District in South Jersey on one of the ways we can approach this with a new solution. They adopted, for the first time in the state's history, a high school graduation requirement to study African-American history. This builds on what the Amistad Commission had accomplished over 30 years ago, that by saying there was going to be an available curriculum that schools could then adopt and choose for themselves, Sheridan Hill says, instead of just saying this is optional, we can make it required. We can bring it and make it relevant and pertinent to every student in the school, regardless of whether or not they're African-American. This is crucial. Doing this kind of work here in Asbury Park, doing this work here in Monmouth County is essential because so much of what's happening here is the reimposition of Jim Crow attitudes and Jim Crow approaches that actually are rooted in keeping the West Side as the West Side. And the economic development down on the shore is then to be kept away from the people who need it most. It's not just Cherry Hill, it's not just the Amistad Commission. Just an hour ago, a little more, two hours ago, I got off the phone with the leaders of Kane University, who is the president of uh, Vermont Revelat, a former superintendent here in Asbury Park. And they are actually redesigning the higher ed infrastructure for the entire state to make all access more equitable for every family in the state and to lower costs. And this is the challenge of the next decade. Can we actually revise our curriculum so it's more rewarding and people get more value out of what they're getting from both P to 12 and higher education, but then go further and actually do it at a lower cost, leveraging some of the technological breakthroughs that we've seen in the last two years due to the pandemic. This is what Kane University is doing to move the ball forward, and I'm very proud to be a part of that. One of the key lessons, and this is where I want to focus on Asbury Park in detail, is that we look at this community and we see it typically as a story of a history since the founding by James Bradford. And that that story of a middle class religious retreat built for families, that always obscured the story of the migrant labor that then served within the hotels that um, in the most horrific sense of what appears in my book, had to use beach number four, which is where the sewer line emptied out. And so the segregation here in this community was pervasive, but it built this perception of an inclusive, um, extraordinary resort. And so I think we've got to go back further. And so just today, I was scanning a bunch of documents about the history of Asbury. And what struck me in the 18th century, and this has been uh, really the amazing work of my colleague, Rick Gaffney. Rick, are you here? Thank you, Rick. Way in the back. Um, Rick's new book, Stories of Slavery in New Jersey, really gives us a way to look at how important enslavement was in the Garden State um, before the American Revolution. Most of the time we're teaching people about slavery in the antebellum sense, in Virginia, in Maryland, uh, the 
Carolinas, Mississippi, Kentucky, Tennessee, New Jersey's history of slavery has now come to the fore, and we're able to understand this story in much more detail. And in the case of Asbury Park in particular, we need to understand the role of this place before it was Asbury Park as a way where a group of people, a band of rebellious slaves, came to attack plantations in Colts Neck, and Holmdale, and Middletown, and Matawan. And they were crucial to the war effort for the British to attempt to uproot slavery in New Jersey between 1777 and 1782. And so that window we don't know much about, and we're still excavating so much of that story. But that is what shapes the idea of Asbury Park, these resorts, these isolated places that are hard to get to, where people are fighting for different visions of freedom. That process is what we're still seeing at war in our town today, that there's a sense of the freedom of wealth and affluence and comfort and fine dining <laughs> that we see right along the water. But there's a very different struggle of freedom that's happening less than a mile away to the west. And so that's what I want to tap into more this evening. I hope I can answer some more questions about it. But most of my research has been around the idea of a black brain belt. This is a set of African-American communities that emerged between 1945 and 1995, largely due to the success of the Fort Monmouth site, and also Bell Labs as a relation, that this was the largest community of black technicians, scientists, and engineers in the United States during that period. An extraordinary growth of a black middle class community that is entirely at odds with the way that we've imagined Asbury since the 1990s, since the even the early 1980s. And so telling the history of how we had a moment to build a wealthy, affluent, stable, integrated community for all people, and we turned our back on it. That's really the story of suburban erasure. This tragedy where we really could have done what we're trying to do now, two or three generations ago. And so to do that, I've engaged in a number of projects, uh, mainly while I was here at Monmouth. Most notable is, of course, the renaming of the main building on campus from being named after the segregationist president, Woodrow Wilson, to being called the Great Hall at Monmouth University. And in the heart of that building, the thing that I'm most proud of, is that there's a memorial to Martin Luther King's 1966 visit to the campus, that his visit was essentially done to fundraise, because there were civil rights advocates in the region, but also to challenge the segregationist leadership of the college. And you can see in the photos when King speaks, <clears throat> the men at the leader of the school, that are leading the school, are sitting there, grim, <laughs> glaring at it as he talks. But they preserved the audio of the speech. And so when you go to the memorial, you're not just seeing the podium that he spoke at, you're not just seeing kind of the photos of the event, the recording is actually playing. So you're hearing King articulate the vision for what we live today in 1966. And along the back of it, there's a timeline that I helped create. That as you're listening to the speech, you're looking at all of the different literary and historical references that King offers in the speech to make the case for an equitable and just society. And he's talking about the history of this region. He's talking about the history of Asbury Park and all the setbacks and the pitfalls and the breakthroughs and the victories. King is laying out the blueprint for what we are living with now 60 years ago. That's public history. That's the bridge between journalists like Kendi, like, Ingram, uh, like um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, and the historians like myself that this is what we need to do to bring more people to the story so we know how to meet the challenges that we face today. And so I'm thankful to be here with Daniel Wolf, who opened the door for me to do this work. Like his 4th of July Asbury Park was a tremendous inspiration for me when I was first starting out. The fact that Rutgers University Press has seen fit to take it on and then republish and add on new work and build it. I'm so proud because Rutgers was not doing this work 25 years ago. Um, they said they looked at suburban ration. They're like, oh, no one wants to talk about suburbs. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and so this chance to bring it back together, I think there's a chance for us to talk about decolonizing publishing so we get more voices 
into the major publishing houses across the United States, but more importantly, to decolonize leadership, to reimagine who we trust as being in charge of what makes our society grow. And to that end, my last challenge to everybody is to invest in the West Side, to invest in the neglected and impoverished black communities across the state and around the country. I think of a dear friend of mine, Madonna Carter Jackson, who's written two books on the West Side's history and her father's career as a photographer, documenting the success of black middle class families in that region. But even before that, there was Lenora Walker McKay, whose two books published in the mid-1970s as part of the bicentennial celebration were titled The Blacks of Monmouth County, Volumes 1 and 2 and just absolutely priceless treasure troves of the stories who made this kind of freedom, not a racially segregated freedom, not an economically constrained freedom, but a freedom for all people. That's what Jackson and McKay are talking about. This is the work that the T. Thomas Fortune Center is dedicated to. The center itself wouldn't exist without a massive $11 million investment from a local philanthropist and real estate developer who looked around at all of the real estate construction that's happening and said, we can do something different. We can turn our money to a socially just end to then empower people who have been excluded from the way that our towns have gone. And so the challenge is now to invest, especially in Asbury and Long Branch and Red Bank, in these historic churches that animated these communities, that are the bulwark, that are the center of how these communities have survived. And if we can do that, then we can do a lot of the work that I had spelled in my scholarship. We can build real, real estate investment trusts. We don't have to look to people who are basically just investing from larger cities to convert us into towns where it's just about the parties that we can throw. We can build really sustainable job systems, wealth creation systems for the folks who have been kept in poverty and in the working class for far too long. And so that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. I appreciate y'all taking the time to come and learn and talk together. And so at this point, I believe I am welcoming up our introducer for Daniel Wolf.